Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to the second part of my lecture. And today the focus will be on carrier envelope phase stabilization on different ultrafast lasers which you can use to do such a stabilization and also on the impact and the possible applications in metrology. So the program for today, what we definitely want to do in the two hours that we have are the first four points. So discussing the accuracy of clocks, discussing optical frequency comms, and how you can generate them, what are the necessities in order to generate them. And then afterwards, a short discussion on possible application areas for which such frequency comms are used. And then finally, um, I want to discuss ultra-fast dial pump solid state lasers for frequency comms, because this is still a relatively new area. Initially, it was done with titanium sapphire lasers. Afterwards, the fiber lasers came in, and it's only recently in the last years that you can also use dial pump solid state lasers, and there are a couple of frontiers for which such dial pump solid state lasers are highly attractive. Then, um, if we manage to go through to this, in less than two hours, then I will still discuss a few things about high power lasers. And uh, these were the points which I didn't have the time to speak of in the last lecture. So let's see how it will work out. Okay, so accuracy of clocks. Today, ultra stable clocks and lasers are intrinsically linked. So if you want to build a high accuracy clock, you absolutely do need lasers. And initially, the lasers were only a kind of tool for preparing the atoms in the right state that you can interrogate some microwave transitions. But today, it even goes further. You can directly look at optical transitions in atoms. And that's the first point that I want to discuss. So here you can see um, a diagram showing the accuracy of clocks as function of the year. So starting 1,000 years back in the past and ending today. And uh, here you can see how the accuracy developed. So uh, the picture is from Ted Hensch from his Nobel lecture in 2005. And so initially, humans didn't really need a very high accuracy for their normal life. Um, I mean, if you, if you go farming or something like this, it doesn't really matter. You rise when the sun goes up and go to bed when it goes down. Everything is fine, so even if your clocks only have a thousand seconds per day of accuracy, you still can live with it. Uh, but people try to develop better and better clocks, and especially here in this period, a very strong progress was done. And this is because at that time, people needed more and more accurate clocks for navigation. If you want to send a ship over the Atlantic Ocean, you need a precise clock so that you know which positions of the stars gives you the right direction. And so here was really a big development. And with a mechanical clock, you went then to the, to the regime of uh, seconds or milli even less than a second per day. So really high accuracies even over months of travel. Um, also, maybe a small remark. The navigation is still one of the important, or important applications for clocks. So if you use your GPS, it's actually based on very precise clocks, which are simply placed at different positions around the Earth. And you receive different signals from different satellites, so you need at least three, ideally a few more. And then by simple triangul triangulation, you can determine where exactly you are. Now, then the development went further. Uh, quartz clocks could reach then accuracies better than a millisecond, reaching up to the microsecond per day. And then something um, happened which really became much, much more precise, and that was the realization of atomic clocks based on microwave transitions. And cesium has a very nice microwave transition. If you develop this further um, from the maser, then finally up to fountain clocks, you can reach accuracies which are in the error of 100 picoseconds per day. So this is an accuracy of 10 to the minus 15. Now, 10 to, so this is why at one point um, 
one had to change the definition of time. For a pretty long time, uh, time was defined by astronomical events, rotation of the Earth. But the problem is that this is something that, which is not particularly constant. The Earth is not an ideal um, uh, structure. You have loss of energy in the rotation. It deforms. And in this way, the rotation frequency of the Earth changes. And you need something better. And so with cesium, you then had the possibility to have something which you could measure at the 10 to the minus 15 level, even at different laboratories in the world. And so that's why then, I think in the 60s, 70s, the SI system changed their definition of time and changed it towards the cesium definition. So now you have a transition. You define the second as a transition which is in the 9.1 gigahertz regime. Now, 10 to the minus 15, in order to understand what this means, uh, well, it's a little bit hard to imagine how you can, can see this. If you look at geological scales, you have a better idea of how precise this is. So um, the Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago. There was one big event shortly after the creation of the moon. Uh, one thinks, or a lot of people think, that it's due to an asteroid hitting the Earth. And if you would be able to start, or if you, if you would have been able to start one of the good atomic clocks with 10 to the minus 15 precision at the time of the formation of the moon, today it would be off by only 142 seconds. So this is extremely precise. Another example, which is also quite often linked to the impact of a meteorite, also we are not 100% sure what caused it. That's the end, uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And um, if you would have started a clock at that time, it would only be off now by two seconds. So it's extremely precise. Actually, time is one of is a, the most precise quantity that humans can measure. Um, how does a typical clock look like with which you can define such time? Well, what you want is you want to excite, you want to put the cesium atoms in a certain state and then have their oscillations happening and afterwards interrogate the state. And ideally, you, can, you want to do it after a relatively long time. This can increase your accuracy. In a maser, you shoot the atoms through a relatively short distance and you also have a relatively high speed, so the interrogation time is not very long. What you can do, on the other hand, is you can throw the atoms in the air, and then they come down after, let's say, half a second to a second, and that gives you much more potential for precision. So in the PTB in Germany, in the SEAT in France, also on the NIST, in the United States, you have well-developed fountain clocks, which currently define the international atomic time. Uh, my predecessor at the University of Neuchâtel, he suggested uh, also a fountain clock, which is currently in development in our group. The normal fountain clocks work with the way that they prepare a ball of, of a sample of atoms and then they throw it in the air and they come down exactly the same path, which makes it quite easy to develop such a clock with respect to gradients and uh, other problems because they take exactly the same path down. But you only have pulsed operation, which somehow limits the accuracy, or which makes it more challenging to have the full potential of accuracy. And also, the number of atoms you can put into one sample is somewhat limited because you have collision defects. And Pierre, what he suggested was to make a real fountain where you have a continuous stream of atoms. You have a lot of additional challenges linked to this. But in principle, you then have the possibility for a higher flux of atoms, which gives you a larger potential for accuracy. And this is currently in development together with the Federal Institute of Metrology in Metas in Switzerland. Uh, one thing that we want to do once we have fully characterized this clock is to participate in a big project um, from the European Space Agency. And uh, this mission is called Atomic Clock Ensemble in Space, ACES. For this project, the French partners at CIRT, they built an atomic clock, the Faro clock, 
which will actually travel to space. It will be put into the International Space Station and um, then you can compare this clock on the space station with different clocks worldwide. And in this way, you have a possibility to compare all the different fountains in the world. Inside Europe, you can already compare fountains using fiber networks, but uh, so far there hasn't been any comparison to the ones, for example, in the US or in Japan. And this will then give po a possibility to really do very precise analysis of the different clock types. And also, we hopefully can learn something about the Earth because gravitation has an influence on the clocks. P some people even hope to see strange things like anisotropies of the speed of light or maybe some space-time variation of fundamental physical constants. Let's see what comes out. But okay, let's go back to this diagram. So with the cesium clocks, you can, already can do very good things. But the reason why Mr. Hench showed this diagram in a Nobel lecture is actually not to make advertisement for cesium, but to tell that this is an old technology and that optical atomic, optical atomic clocks are breaking the record by far. And today you have optical atomic clocks at the 10 to the minus 18 level. So for such a clock, if you lift it by a few centimeters, you already have an influence of the gravitational shift of time. So you can really extremely precisely measure positions. This is also a big challenge uh, if you want later to compare different clocks, which heights is a zero heights and so on, but that's a different story. Um, but so this means that we are currently at a level where people start to talk about a redefinition of time. And the only thing why it's not done yet is because nobody really has an idea how far we can go on one side. And the second is also nobody has a good idea which atom in the end will win. We took cesium because that's a pretty straightforward thing. But for the optical atomic clocks, you have a couple of atoms which are highly promising. Uh, strontium, ytterbium, uh, even cesium, mercury. And at the moment, nobody can really say which has the highest potential. And then the other thing also, if you want to redefine time, at least a few different institutes should have such clocks running so that you can say, OK, we get the same results. We can compare it. So at the moment, I think it will probably still need another 10 years or so. But then time will most likely be redefined. OK, so um, how, why do we get such a better performance for the optical clocks compared to the microwave clocks? Well, in, let's have a look how a clock works in detail. So what you need are two things. On one side, you need some oscillating event, so something that is simply repetitive in time, as precise as possible, like, for example, the movement of a pendulum or the rotation of the Earth. And, but this is not enough. You also need to be able to count the number of oscillations if you want to measure time. And that's what, done, what is done here in this clockwork. So you have the oscillation, but every time that one oscillation finishes, something changes here in this counter, and you can face coupled count exactly the number of oscillations. So you have here one movement, for example, a movement which is only once an hour, or a second movement which is only once every 12 hours. But this oscillation here is, is face stable to the oscillation here. You simply divide by a big number n. Now, there is a general principle uh, which is a little bit hard to, to justify, but the general idea is the higher your frequency, the higher the potential for accuracy. In reality, you have to look what, is, what are the possible perturbations that you have, but it, it usually works quite well like this. So if you have a pendulum, you're talking about usually oscillations in the second regime. For a quartz resonator, you are already talking about millions of oscillations per second. Now, with a microwave resonator, 
You have then oscillations which are under gigahertz regime. And for optical atomic transitions, you are talking about terahertz, hundreds of terahertz of oscillations. So you win a factor of more than 10,000 compared to the microwave world. And that is what gives you a much larger potential for precision. What basically it means that you can isolate atoms in a, in a very good way. You can isolate them from the rest of the world and then have extremely precise spectroscopy that you can do with it. Now, one problem that you have is how can you count it? For the pendulum, it's easy. Mechanics can do it. For the quartz resonator, okay, was developed at the same time when you had electronics available, so you can build counters, that works fine. Microelectronics easily brings you into the gigahertz regime, so counting at 10 gigahertz is also no problem at all. But if you have an optical atomic transition, this is a major challenge. How on earth can you count several, uh, yeah, so here you have billion and then 100,000 billion oscillations per second or more. This is extremely hard. And um, so what you need to do if you have an optical transition which you want to link to time, you need to make a system which links the definition of time, so a cesium microwave frequency standard, the basic unit in the SI system. You need to link this phase stably to an optical frequency standard, which you can obtain by spectroscopy. And for example, one possibility is to have a calcium frequency standard. So this has a frequency of 455,000 gigahertz. Now for a very long time, uh, this was impossible. Then at the PTB, Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig, they actually made a very heroic experiment where they used nonlinear optics and many lasers to link this standard here to the cesium frequency standard. And in, in order to do this, what they did is, so they have then here one frequency standard, so they have light at this wavelength, and then they take a diode laser, which is simply frequency doubled, nonlinear optics. Then they had a color center laser, which was frequency doubled to the frequency of the diet laser. Then they had a CO2 laser, which was doubled, but then there was also another laser. And okay, <laughs> starts to be quite complicated. I mean, there are lasers on this, on this sheet, which I never uh, before heard about. I mean, anybody of you ever heard about a methanol laser? And, and it was really challenging to operate this whole system. Um, while I was a student, I visited the PTB, and uh, I mean, this project, it was really quite impressive, the space that you need to build these systems up. I think they, they prepared themselves for several weeks, and then during one week, they just tried to run all the different systems, and finally could link this to this year. But that was a huge challenge. Now, the reason why Mr. Henge had this nice graph with the optical clocks in a Nobel lecture is actually because he, together with uh, John Hall from the NIST, uh, he developed a technique which actually can replace this whole stuff with one single frequency comb laser. So with one single laser, you can directly link this to this. And that is the key target that we want to discuss in today's lecture. So what is an optical frequency comb? We already discussed in the last lecture the mode locking and ultra-short pulses, and this is kind of the basis of it all. So what you can do is you can have this optical frequency, which is extremely fast, and then you can link it, like with a gearbox, to something which is much slower, microwave frequencies. And the idea what you do is, if you have a very stable frequency comb, nailed down, highly precise, then you simply can generate beat signals between, for example, an unknown frequency and the other frequency. And in this way, 
you have a stable signal which you can use for evaluation of this frequency. So, and in order to have such a COM, you need some laser which produces it. And for this, femtosecond lasers are ideally suited. So, uh, again, if we have a continuous wave laser, we just have a single mode. Now, if we add different additional modes to it, what happens is that this here develops into something which looks more and more like a pulse, and then this pulse simply propagates inside of this cavity. So here on the bottom, okay, with the light in this room, you can't see it, but I put a link, you can later see it on the PDF file, and there you have a Java animation which you can use to show this. Unfortunately, on this computer, I couldn't get the Java to run, but there you can simply add more and more modes into the simulation, and then you see how a pulse developed and how it propagates inside the cavity. That's something that I recommend everybody. Basically, it's just applied Fourier transform. And so, so that means that the spectrum of a short pulse oscillating in a cavity corresponds to a lot of individual lines, and they are exactly spaced by the same frequency because this is given by the repetition rate of your cavity. Now, if you do this, you have one interesting thing. So this cavity um, has a restriction. You have, need the pulse to oscillate during this, but you can have a difference between the electric field and between the group velocity. So if you look at the pulse, what you actually have, you have here an envelope and inside you have this oscillating field. And if you do a full round trip, afterwards for, there is no, no uh, demand on the face that it exactly needs to be the same. And so that means that after a cavity round trip, the pulse can look differently. So here you can see different phases of the oscillating field compared to the envelope. So for example, if you have here zero, the maximum is exactly at the maximum of the envelope. If you have pi, it is actually at the position where it's the lowest. This is now with pi. And so you, you can tune this or you can shift this under the envelope. Now, if you look into the frequency space, well, um, a shift by a constant frequency is simply a time shift, so it's, it's like an operator shifting the whole thing a little bit back in time. And uh, that means that this is in the frequency space simply a certain frequency that you get per cavity round trip. And this is called the carrier envelope offset frequency. So the structure of your frequency comb that you have is you have these lines separated by the repetition rate and then if you just continue these lines until zero, you see a small offset, and that is given by the difference between phase and group velocity for a cavity round trip. Now, if you want to stabilize this comb, you need access to this one. You need to have access to the repetition rate, but also to the absolute position of such a frequency comb. And the big question is how can you stabilize it? Well, the first question is, how can you measure it? So if you look at this diagram here, so this is, by the way, very symbolical. Uh, in principle, we said that we have, for a typical mode lock laser, if we make something that has one and a half meters, we have 100 megahertz of repetition rate. I said before that the optical frequency of lasers is in the hundreds of, ter hundreds of terahertz regime. So in reality, you would have lines much, much denser. But uh, that's a different story. So let's just assume that we have a laser which looks like this. And OK, now one possibility to measure this frequency is to use an indirect method. Because the problem is that if you look at the spectrum of such a laser, where you want to measure it, you actually don't have any light. Typically, you just have, even for a titanium sapphire laser with very broad spectrum, more than an octave, you have your main line at 800 nanometer. 
So maybe, I don't know how, much, how many terahertz it is, maybe 300 or something like this. And um, then um, you have a bandwidth which can extend nearly to an octave, but here in this regime you clearly have zero. And so how can you measure this? Well, one possibility is to use an indirect method. So let's just assume that we have one line here on the uh, low frequency side of the spectrum. And uh, this is then the CO frequency, this small part here, and a certain number of times the repetition rate. So M1 times the repetition rate. And if we now, oops, uh-oh, there's something wrong with this animation, just a second. Okay. Okay, this is a little bit surprising. Okay, oh no. Okay, now it's uh, somewhat, now it seems to work. Okay, so, um, so if we simply use nonlinear optics and we just do second harmonic generation of this frequency here, what do we get? So we just get again here this frequency and now we are in this regime. So before, let's say this was red and now we are in the blue frequency regime. Now, for the second harmonic frequency, we simply have to do twice this frequency here, and that means that we get two times the CO frequency, and then we just have two times M1 of the repetition rate. And then we have, if the COM spans more than an octave, we will also have a line close to this one, which is simply the CO frequency, and then another time, uh, the repetition rate. And uh, so 2M1 times the repetition rate. And we will now be able to see a beating signal between these two frequencies. And this beating signal is simply given by the repetition rate. In reality, you also get a beating between this one here and the other one and all the other frequencies, but basically, you then have a symmetrical situation if you look with a RF spectrum analyzer in it. So you have one to this side, one to the other side, to the first harmonic. But uh, so this simply gives you a, a simple way <coughs> to measure this carrier envelope offset frequency. Now, the big problem that you have with this is that you need to provide an octave spanning spectrum. And typically, uh, octave spanning spectra are quite hard to obtain from a laser. Recently, I think it was a group of Franz Gertner, or a couple of years ago already, he managed to get it directly out of a titanium sapphire laser. By, but normally, what you have to do is you also have to use nonlinear optics in order to get such a broad spectrum. And what you do is supercontinuum generation. So both in the group of John Hall and also Ted Hench, the breakthrough which allowed their experiments leading to the Nobel Prize was the availability of new fibers which had the ability to generate a broad, coherent supercontinuum from input short pulses which were much, much more narrow. And um, I, I once heard a lecture from John Hall. I don't know exactly what happened, but in the lecture he said that he really had big problems in getting the fiber for his experiments. So they invented this technology at Bell Labs, but then there were patent claims, and uh, it was all a big mess, and he tried to get it, but there were then some, they tried to do the paper, paper word right with NDAs and so on. And finally, at one point, he just got an envelope with the fiber in, and nobody really said who sent it, and he could use it then, or they could use it to get this result. At least that's how I remember this story. So sometimes some components are simply critical, and if you don't have them, you can't do what you want to do. So why has this been such a big breakthrough? Um, but maybe before talking about why, oh no, sorry, we started at 4.30, so I still have 30 minutes for, before the break. Okay, so um, why has this been such a big breakthrough? What are the areas for which you can use this? And uh, actually today, you really have a large range of areas in which you can use such frequency comps. 
So you have your mode lock laser, which simply then generates this octave spanning supercontinuum and you stabilize it and there are numerous areas for which you can use this. So one area is the optical atomic clocks. That's the evident one. You now have a possibility if you stabilize this frequency com to link the optical frequencies to the microwave frequencies. But there are many other areas for which you can use it. For example, one area is the area of high harmonic generation and auto second signs. Um, if you have very short pulses and you have a highly nonlinear effect like high harmonic generation, you can see a physical difference in the result if you have this situation or if you have this situation. So if you have something which only has one extremely high peak, this has some quite striking advantages also for single attosecond pulse generation, but I don't want to say anything about this. Tomorrow you will hear a great lecture about all these different things and the influence of CO phase and so on. So that's one area, but there are many other areas. Uh, another very important area is frequency com spectroscopy. So with frequency comms, you have the possibility to do spectroscopy much faster than you can do with standard techniques. And I will say a few words about this later. And this, for example, can then be used for trace gas sensing, um, being able to detect extremely small quantities of gas in a very precise way. That has, for example, an impact on one side on security, so you can do a remote detection, sending a laser beam somewhere and seeing if there are some some dangerous chemicals, for example, or some explosives, or you can imagine a device where you just breathe in and it can detect certain special markers which could indicate diseases in your body. Um, other possibilities are, for example, um, frequency synthesis. So you can take the COM, you can modulate different parts of the COM and in this way generate arbitrary waveforms. Uh, you can then use these waveforms for, for example, for cryptography or also for terahertz generation. Um, you can use the comms even for quite surprising applications like the search for extra solar planets. I will say also a few words about this. So the first thing, what is kind of the evident one is simply the spectroscopy. So here is an image which I took from Gila and um, it illustrates a little bit the idea of a molecular fingerprinting system. So you just take a gas and send it towards a frequency com and then afterwards at the same time you can detect all the different possibilities for such a um, that you have. So you can with one shot uh, very fast take a full spectrum of various molecules. And as I said, this has a large application error for security, medicine, and so on. Um, another, and how can you do it in reality? So here in this picture, you would still need some, some spectrometer to be able to detect it. One possibility is to simply use two optical frequency comms at the same time. So if you imagine that you have two frequency comms, that's shown here, and you make it such that the one frequency is the same, but then you have a small offset in the repetition rate of the different frequencies. So let's say you have in one comp a repetition rate of 100 megahertz, and in the other one you have a repetition rate of 100.01 or 100.1 megahertz. Now, if you look at it in the frequency domain, so on one line you stabilize both of them, and then you get an offset of each individual COM line. So let's say that you have a 100 kilohertz offset in the repetition rate. The first beating signal that you then will get between the two COMs is 100 kilohertz. And then the next one will have 200 kilohertz, 300 kilohertz, 400 kilohertz, and so on. So that means that you have a possibility to link a frequency in the beating in the microwaves to an optical frequency area. And um, now what you can do is that you can send one of the comms through a certain um, 
thing that you want to measure, for example, through a gas in which you have some molecules. And then you take the second one, you bring it afterwards together, and then you record the beating signal. And now the heights for one of these comps will be lower uh, if there is an absorption. And also then you can detect this in the beating signal. And that gives you a possibility by recording a beating signal, which in the time domain then is extremely fast, um, at the repetition frequency. And that gives you then the information on the optical spectrum. You can do it then over several shots in this way, in a, increase your accuracy. And this is much, much faster than standard techniques that you can use for frequency detection. Then a question, what do you use as suitable offset frequency, repetition rate frequency? If you make the repetition rate frequency too large, then you might miss some of the features. If you make it too small, it's uh, also not really worth it. If you, if you have doubler broadened gases, which are more in the gigahertz regime, but that's an all a different discussion. But the potential that you have to do very fast, high signal to noise, spectroscopy with such a technique is extremely big. And the other thing that is nice about it, you don't need to move anything. It's not like that in a, in a grating spectrometer, you have a grating which you have to move, and it takes you then a few seconds to detect a full spectrum. So this is really one, one of the key application areas. And you also then have the possibility at the same time to detect many different molecules. So with standard laser spectroscopy solutions, typically you take one or two lasers, you look only as a, at a molecular line for a certain molecule, but here you really have the whole uh, bandwidth to make a high, high resolution detection of several molecules at the same time. Then I mentioned that there is also the possibility to use it for a quite surprising area, which is the search for, um, for extrasolar planets. So how does this work? Well, if you look at the sun, there are certain lines missing, Fraunhofer lines. Simply by absorption, you can see, um, so you, you have some um, gases in the sun, which then will absorb certain parts of the spectrum, and you can see these lines. Now, if you want to measure these lines very, very, very precisely with a standard spectrometer, you hardly can do it. But what you can do is, if you have a frequency com that you then shine in addition to the light that you get from a sun, then you can do a calibration of the spectrum and be much more precise. So that's the basic idea. Now, one challenge that you have if you want to do this is that the resolution of such astronomic spectrometers are not very high, and um, that means that if you would take a 100 megahertz laser, you simply would see something which is very bright and which you, where you cannot distinguish the individual lines. So in order to use it for the calibration of astronomical spectrometers, you need to figure out a way to make a COM which is in the tens of gigahertz regime. And that's quite a challenge. Here is a publication which was in science already in 2008 where Udem and Hench uh, proposed a system which was based then on uh, frequency filtering of a COM with lower repetition rate, and they could use it for such applications. And why does it help you to look for planets um, which are outside of the, of the solar system? Well, there the idea is, so if you imagine, so if you have, for example, the Earth circling around the sun, uh, if you usually, if you do the analysis, you go in the center of Mars system, so that means that the sun also moves a little bit and the planet moves a little bit around it. That's illustrated here. You have one position of the planet and then another position of the planet, and then the sun will move in this direction, otherwise it will move in this direction. So you just have a kind of movement of the planet and the sun. And now, if the sun is moving in this direction, you will get a different shift of the emitted light than if it's moving towards you. So simply, you have a Doppler shift of the emission. And that's something that you can measure for certain systems. 
And uh, so this is why this has been such a big success. And then, as I mentioned, there's the other application area, which are the optical atomic clocks, where you can then use such a frequency comp to link it to the RF domain. As I said before, there are many systems right now which you can use. Uh, so there's, for example, one system is based on Iterbium, and here they claim 10 to the minus 18 in 2013 already. Uh, so the clock transition is then a transition between the 1S and the 3P level, which is very, a very, very narrow transition. And then you can uh, cool these, have magneto-optical traps and so on. It's a quite complex system. I don't have the time to go into detail into this, but we are now at the level where people are talking about 10 to the minus 18, or also, for example, for a strontium lattice clock. That's a paper from this year, 2015. Um, they also managed to get into this regime. So as I said before, that means that pretty soon um, cesium will not be, or the RF transition in cesium will not be good enough anymore for the definition of the time, and that people will ultimately seek another solution. Okay, so um, now what I would like to do is give an overview on different laser aspects for the realization of such frequency comps. So this is, uh, I already introduced ultra-fast solid state lasers in the last lecture, and now I just want to have a look how ultra-fast solid state lasers can be used for frequency comps and what are their advantages. So the, the key necessity that you need for a laser system for generating frequency comps using femtosecond pulses is this octave spanning supercontinuum. So this is really the critical challenge and that typically means that you need pulses of sufficient peak power on one side uh, to get the broad bandwidth of the full octave and then on the second side it also means that you need sufficiently short pulses so that the, that the supercontinuum that you're generating will be coherent. Because in the end what you want to do is to take one line in the red and frequency double it so that it can beat with one line in the blue. And that means that in the wings of the spectrum it still needs to be coherent. Now the initial lasers which were used for this task were titanium sapphire lasers. So titanium sapphire lasers are great lasers. They have a very low intrinsic noise. And this is because um, the output coupling in the titanium sapphire laser is relatively low. And you then just have one pulse oscillating inside your cavity without too many perturbation. And in this way, in this high Q, cavity, you can reduce the noise quite significantly. There's a challenge for titanium sapphire lasers. You need a green pump. Um, and green pump diets only very recently appeared. So at the moment, I would say that all of the classical titanium sapphire lasers, they are based on pump lasers, which cost uh, several ten thousands. Um, the laser itself only makes a power level in, in the watt regime. So this is, this is one of the big challenges. Um, the power that you get can get from titanium sapphire is okay for frequency comms. On the other hand, it's limited to the few watt regime. That's mainly because you have such a high quantum defect as we discussed in the uh, questions after my last presentation. What is very impressive is that uh, Bartels and co-workers uh, at Chila um, they actually managed to get titanium sapphire lasers operating at very high repetition rates. As I said, high repetition rates have applications, for example, for the astrocom. But also, on the other hand, it also makes it easier to separate individual lines. So with one grating, you then can have individual lines which, with which you can do something. And uh, there, they managed in 2009 to produce a laser which has 10 gigahertz of repetition rate, which is very impressive. Now then afterwards, uh, so the, because it's titanium sapphire lasers, I mean, the situation changed a little bit today, 
but a couple of years ago when you bought the titanium sapphire laser, you better also bought a physicist who is able to adjust it and make sure that it's always running. Uh, today you can buy commercial lasers, but I, I still would say it's not really industrial uh, level where you would be able to have it operating 24-7, and I also would not suggest to drop such a laser. So <laughs> um, this is a different situation for fiber oscillators. So there was a huge progress in the last years in fiber oscillators in general, and um, fiber oscillators, you can build them in very compact packages. So this year, may, maybe one common, this year is a laser with which you can do a frequency comm. I think for the extremely small fiber laser so far, nobody really made a frequency comm. It's still a little bit larger, but in principle, the potential is there to do a, a integration to make everything very compact. Um, they are convenient and robust. You can now kind of bring all the components together, fiber splice them, and in this way, uh, also, they are quite robust against vibrations and other uh, perturbance that you can do to it. Um, also, Ingmar Hartel managed to generate one gigahertz com, and uh, probably you can go a little bit further. On the other hand, I don't think that easily with a, uh, with a fiber oscillator it will be possible to really make a frequency com at 10 gigahertz, but maybe I'm also wrong. Let's see how it will develop. I think this will be challenging. Um, the problem that you have is that typically with fiber oscillators, you get much more noise. And one reason for this is that in the, in the fiber oscillator, you have a high gain. You can afford to operate with a large amount of output coupling. That's actually what quite often you ha even have to do to prevent uh, nonlinear problems from happening. And uh, so this means because of the high gain, you also have a much higher quantum noise. So you have much more emission in, of spontaneous emission into the laser mode, which is the kind of ultimate limit that you can reach. And then the other thing is that with a fiber oscillator and ultra short pulses, uh, you are not able to really make comparable output like for a titanium sapphire laser. For a titanium sapphire laser, making a watt in 50 femtosecond pulses, it's, it's kind of peanuts, it's easy to do. If you want to do the same, or a, uh, at a repetition rate, let's say, of 100 megahertz, so you also have significant pulse energy. If you try to do the same with a fiber oscillator, you run into a lot of problems because you have nonlinearities and uh, dispersion, and it makes it much more complicated. So typically, in many cases, what you do is, you have small seat oscillators which have limited power levels, and then afterwards you need amplifiers, but the amplifiers again then give you additional noise. And that's why then with fiber oscillators, typically if you look at the CO beat, the free running CO beat is much, 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 much higher. It is possible to get very good quality of the final frequency comm of it, but you need a lot of electronics, feedback loops, and so on in order to make it happen. And now another approach, which then uh, is, was inv investigated in the last few years, is to do a kind of combination of both. So the fibers, you can pump them with diets. Titanium sapphire, you can't. And diet pump solid state lasers, especially based on euterbium and erbium, uh, they actually combine the advantages. So you can have this low intrinsic noise. Uh, it's convenient and robust. You can do direct diet pumping. The potential also for doing it at a low price is very high. You can get extremely high power levels, much higher than what you can get directly out of fibers in a good quality. And um, you also can go to pretty high repetition rates. And so diet pump solid state lasers are very promising technology for frequency comms. At the moment, to my knowledge, um, there is no company on the market which sells you a frequency comm below, let's say, at least $100,000. I think a Menlo system, probably the one that we have in our lab, I think it was 300 k or something like this. Maybe today for 200 k you already can get something, but... Uh, at the moment, there are no really cheap frequency comm systems. That also limits a little bit the applications that you can have in real life. 
So even if there are nice applications that you can do for spectroscopy or other areas, if the lasers are so expensive, it will not be done. And uh, so we think that diet pump solid state lasers are a possibility to make it much cheaper. Fiber lasers for sure as well, but uh, yeah, let's see how it will develop. Okay, so what are the different frontiers uh, that you can address with solid state lasers? On one side, you can address to generate frequency comms with a very narrow line width. It's the first thing which is interesting. Um, the second is that you can try to have a look what are the possibilities with dial pump solid state lasers towards scaling up the repetition rate. Is it, will it also be possible to go to 10 gigahertz with a dial pump solid state laser like it has been done with a titanium sapphire laser? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. Uh, then you have the possibility to generate very high average power comms. And so that means that if you just try to isolate a single line, you will then have much, much more power in the individual lines. And that then also increases the possibility to use it in real experiments. And finally, there's then also the discussion about spectral coverage. There are two sides in which you can go. So typical lasers are working in the infrared. You have two possibilities. One is to go strongly towards the mid-infrared, which is highly attractive due to the availability of a lot of lines in gases which allow to identify biological, biologically relevant molecules. And then you have the other side in which you can go, in which you also have transitions, which at the moment you can't even look at because you don't have any good laser sources in the 100 to 10 nanometer regime. And for this also, then high harmonic generation is actually a way to go. And finally, the discussion is how can you get compact and reliable and cheap sources? Okay, so let's first have a look at low noise. So um, this is a picture of a typical diet pumped solid state laser. And that's a work which we started a few years ago, uh, which then resulted in the lowest, lowest noise um, uh, CO from a 1.5 laser. And uh, so this, the laser looks like this. You have here one pump diet. This pump diet is fiber coupled and generates up to 600 milliwatt at 976 nanometer. And then you launch the light from this pump diet. Uh, so you do, um, we have a lens system. And then you launch it here into an erbium iterbium glass uh, gain crystal, uh, two millimeter long. So this is a mirror which transmits at 976 and which reflects at the laser wavelengths, which is 1.5 micrometer. And uh, then you have a cavity. So here you have the two end mirrors. One end mirror is the output coupler, and then the other end mirror is the CSEM for the mode locking. And so that means that if you pump it, a pulse will build up because you have the CSEM which initiates and stabilizes the mode formation. And then you simply do a ping pong between these mirrors, go through here, and then to the output coupler, and then the whole way back. And now, as I mentioned in the last lecture, if you want a soliton, then you need to balance the cell phase modulation with the right amount of dispersion in order to stabilize the pulse. And here, the negative dispersion is introduced uh, on one side by the glass medium, which at 1.5 has slightly negative dispersion. But mainly what we do is we then also have 10 mirrors here. So this is why we have all this ping pong on flat mirrors. For the cavity, we could also simply replace it uh, by, by air and not have this folding. And uh, they all have minus 100 femtoseconds squared of negative dispersion. And then afterwards, we send the pulses through an isolator. Mode lock lasers, unfortunately, are very, very sensitive to back reflections. So typically, all components, uh, we take very much care that there are no reflections to the laser. Even a reflection of minus 60 dB sometimes can destabilize the laser. Um, one reason is also because the CSEM 
usually has two recovery times, one fast one, one slower one. And if you send something back to the laser during the time when the CSAM is still a little bit saturated, this can destabilize the whole process. And um, then afterwards, we have a wave plate uh, just for possibility to turn the polarization right into the fiber that we are using. This fiber is polarization maintaining. And it's a highly nonlinear fiber, which then allows us to generate an octave spanning supercontinuum. Then afterwards, we build this F to 2F interferometer in which we take one part of the spectrum, frequency double it, and beat it with the blue part of the spectrum. And uh, we send it on a photodiode and can detect the CO frequency. Now, this laser uh, operates then at a wavelength of 1.5 micrometer. The repetition rate is 75 megahertz. Um, the average output power is 110 milliwatts. It has 170 femtoseconds. 170 femtoseconds uh, for a soliton at this um, wavelength of 1.5 corresponds to a spectrum of 14 nanometers. So we are nearly transform limited with these pulses. And uh, one thing which is also quite nice about the laser is it doesn't need a lot of energy. If you build a titanium sapphire laser using a frequency double pump, usually the efficiency is very low. You might need a kilowatt for a, for a laser which gives you less than a watt of ultra-fast power. Here, actually, this diet is quite efficient, and uh, it's a 600 milliwatt diet, so the overall power consumption is less than 3 watts. Okay, we then need also some, afterwards, some uh, electronic devices for the stabilization. That consumes much more. But for the laser itself, in principle, you would be able to run this on a battery. And uh, now if we have a look at the CO beat, so if we just look at the free running CO beat without any stabilization, from this laser we obtained a full with half maximum of 3.5 kilohertz, and this is much narrower than what you get from a 1.5 fiber laser. We have a commercial 1.5 uh, micron frequency com in, in our lab. And we then also compared the CO stability after stabilizing it with this system, with the Menlo frequency com system. We used exactly the same electronics. And we could see that from the solid, from the solid state laser, we had a 20-fold improvement in its stability. So that's one indication that with dial pump solid state laser in a similar way, like for titanium sapphire lasers, you can generate highly stable frequency comps, but directly diet pump it. Um, now, uh, for the stabilization of the CO frequency, um, you have different methods that you can use. The challenge that you want to do is you need to stabilize two things if you want to have your stable frequency comp. One thing is that you need to stabilize this offset frequency. So this is indicated here. So if the CO frequency changes while your repetition rate is the same, then you simply have a shifting of this whole frequency comp. And then on the other side, if you keep the CO frequency stable, but just make a difference in the repetition rate, then you get this breezing motion. And now that means that if you want to stabilize a frequency comp from any laser, you need two handles. One to control the CO, the other to control the repetition rate. Quite often in real life, what happens is here you have something orthogonal, but in reality, uh, the influence that you have is not fully orthogonal. Uh, with one actuator, you might act on this, but also at the same time on the repetition rate. Now, the standard method which initially was used for the stabilization, for example, for titanium sapphire lasers, that was to um, control the pump power that you send into the gain. Uh, for titanium sapphire lasers, you actually have to make a little bit more complicated system because it's hard to control directly the pump power of a green frequency doubled solid state laser. But OK, let's, let's uh, start first by talking. If you, if you have, a, for example, a diet pump solid state laser, what you can do is 
That's the way how we did it in this laser here. So for the CO stabilization, one thing is that we can change the repetition rate simply by piezo shifting the CSAM. And then the other one is that we can control the CO by changing the pump power a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. In this way, if we increase the pulse energy a little bit, we get more, mainly more SPM, and that's the key effect, why you then have a different effect on the group compared to the phase velocity. And uh, so this is the standard method, the modulation of the gain. Um, so you have your F to 2F setup, you detect the CO frequency, and then you send it to the pump laser, and in this way you can shift it. The problem that you have there is that you are actually limited in speed by the lifetime of your gain. And for titanium sapphire, it's not so horrible. Titanium sapphire has not such a very long gain lifetime. You're talking about microseconds. But if you have an ytterbium laser, for example, there you have a millisecond lifetime, so or several hundred microseconds at least. And that means that this strongly limits, limits the maximum frequency that you can apply. Or let's say differently, if you would modulate this with 100 kilohertz, you hardly would see any change in the laser because the gain simply is too long-lived. Now the second possibility that you have is then um, in order to increase the speed, what you can do is that inside your cavity you put an additional element which then can modulate the power. And with this you can be much, much faster. Um, the problem is if you put some EOM in the cavity, electro-optical modulation, um, you have an element which then will also introduce SPM and dispersion, especially if you want to build a high power laser, this can be a challenge. There was also recently a great result from uh, Thomas Schieble's group who was working at Yila. And what they did was they made a new electro-optical modulator and um, there they used graphene and then simply shifted the absorption by an electric voltage. And in this way, they actually had a system with which they could go to megahertz. And especially for a fiber laser, this is a great approach because for a fiber laser, you don't care so much about losses, but you need a very fast feedback if you want to reduce the noise levels. The problem that you have with this is that it has relatively high losses. So you're talking, I think it was, so the, the maximum modulation was something like 2%. Uh, so for graphene, I think the 2.4% is a magic number. And the losses that you had, I think, were a few percent. So really something very high. If you have a solid state laser, typically the uh, output coupling that you have, if you look back to this laser here, we had an output coupling of only 1.7%. And this also explains why we had this very good performance because the pulse basically is not perturbated a lot. So the, we have a little bit of losses, but overall it must be less than 3% of cavity losses per round trip. And that means that also we don't need a lot of gain. And this gives us a potential. We, we basically have a pulse which is a tiny little, per, line, tiny little bit perturbated. And um, so here, putting such a graphene electro-optical modulator inside a solid state laser and operating it will be, will be quite challenging. Now, um, what we did was doing something a little bit different. So with the CSEM, we have an element which is changing the pulse energy as function of itself on a time scale in the picosecond regime. And what we can actually do is that if we look here at a CSEM reflectivity curve as function of the fluence that we send it on, so that's the same curve that I showed before, uh, so that, that explains that if you have pulse formation, then at one point you're operating maybe here at this regime. And that means that for a pulse, the reflectivity is 99.8. Uh, for CW light, it would be only 90 or 98.9. So less than a percent of change of the reflectivity. But what you can do now is that you simply can change the point of operation of the CSM by putting some additional light onto it. 
So we took a laser diet and simply shone light onto the CSAM and in this way changed the point of operation uh, for the pulse formation. And that means that we also had an electro or an optical, opto-optical modulator. So we could change the loss in the cavity by changing the current here to this laser diet. And that's something which worked very well. So here we have this airbeam terbium glass laser. And so what we did is we just added an additional pump, which was lying around. It was not really the most optimized experiment in the world, uh, but it worked out quite well. So if we look now here at the change of the um, uh, modulation that we could do. So the CO transfer function for, so here you can see the frequency for the gain modulation. Uh, here you can see amplitude and here you can see the phase. So if we do the gain modulation, the change, so that means that we simply, what we do here on one is we just modulate the pump a little bit at a certain frequency, let's say 10 kilohertz, and then we look at the CO signal, how much it changes in amplitude also at the 10 kilohertz. And uh, what we can see is that at one kilohertz, everything is still fine. We can do a change of the CO frequency, but then it just dropped down. And at 10 kilohertz, it's hard to make a change and even uh, the phase now starts to lag behind. So we, we have now a phase change linked to it, and that means that we cannot stabilize much faster. Now, with the other method, which is then this modulation of the CSIM via an optical pump, we could go much faster in terms of repetition rate. So we could get, get up to 300 kilohertz, and uh, we think that we were actually limited also by the bandwidth of our current driver. So this method is a possibility to do a fast modulation. And uh, also if we then are looked afterwards using this CSAM method, we could see that we had a much higher bandwidth of the transfer function. And also if we afterwards looked at the noise levels that we generated, so this is a noise of the CO signal as function of frequency, and here on the bottom, you can see if you integrate this noise now. So for example, in green, you have the noise for the gain mode locking. In red, you have it for the CSAM optical optical modulation. And then what you can see here is the integration of this curve here with respect to frequency. Uh, so initially, you don't gain so much because it's a logarithmic scale. And if you go from 100 hertz, uh, from 10 hertz to 100 hertz, it's anyway not a large x-axis region. So it counts much more in this regime here. And uh, so the integration of this frequency noise then led to, for the pump modulation, about seven, uh, 700 milliradian uh, in this frequency regime here, which goes up to 100 kilohertz. And for the CSAM modulation, it was only 60 milliradian, which is an extremely good value comparable to titanium sapphire lasers or even better for, than for a lot of them. So this seems to be a method which is quite promising. And um, especially the nice thing about it is that you can also apply it to lasers which have very high power levels, like for example, a thin disk laser. We have thin disk lasers which have kilowatt level intracavity power levels and putting another modulator in it will be quite challenging. But putting, either trying to modulate the CSAM that we use for the mode locking or putting a second CSAM in, which we only want to use for the CO locking, that should be relatively easy. Okay, and I think um, this is now a good point for having a five minute break, if it's okay for you. And then afterwards we'll talk about the higher repetition rates from solid state lasers. Okay, let's start again. So as I mentioned before, high repetition rates are interesting on one side because it allows you to do a calibration, for example, for these astronomic spectrometers. So if you want to separate individual wavelengths, it's much easier if, you, if they are more strongly separated. That's one area. The second one is quite often you simply have a certain average power, let's say a watt, and if you now have less spectral lines in total, 
the power in the individual lines is also higher. If you look at the titanium sapphire laser from Bartels, uh, it actually had, I think, watt level output power. And then in the individual lines of this laser, you then had power levels of a milliwatt. So this is something which is, which is macroscopic. You can relatively easily separate these lines and then use them, for example, for spectroscopy. Um, Solid tight pump solid state lasers are also very well suited for high repetition rates. Um, one challenge you have to overcome is this Q, Q switch mode locking, which I mentioned last time. But by optimizing the laser parameters and also the parameters of the saturable absorber, you can overcome it. And already in 2008, uh, 100 gigahertz operation of a tight pump solid state laser was demonstrated. Um, so I said before, 100 megahertz uh, is 1.5 meters of a standing wave cavity. So that means that 100 gigahertz, you're actually then talking about 1.5 millimeters of a standing wave cavity. So the PhD student, Andreas Oehler, who was working on this, did a really good job making it smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is one millimeter here. So here you have the gain element, which has the form of a prism. And uh, this is erbium erbium glass. You have a coating here on the bottom, which is the output coupler coating. And here you have a Brewster plate. Then you have a curved mirror, which has a radius of curvature of less than one millimeter. I think it was 0 0.5 millimeters. There was only one company that we found who can manufacture such mirrors, and they did it by hand. And uh, then here you have the CSEM. So this is then the edge of the CSEM where you send the pulse onto it. So you can really build it very, very, in a very compact way. And um, it gave up to 35 milliwatts. And later, the pulse duration was even 1.1 picosecond that could be obtained from such a laser. Now. For this laser, so far, there was never any CO detection. The big problem here is the pulse duration is somewhat long, and um, the pulse energy is quite low. So if you have 100 gigahertz, that means uh, so one gigahertz corresponds to a nanosecond of cavity round trip time. Uh, that means that for 100 gigahertz, you only have 10 picoseconds of cavity round trip time. The pulse duration is a picosecond, so you have one picosecond where you have the pulse every 10 picoseconds. So that means that the increase of the peak power compared to the uh, average power is only a factor of 10. So it has a peak power of 350 milliwatts, and that makes it a little bit hard to generate, an, or impossible at the current state of technology to generate an octave spanning supercontinuum. I think that probably by amplification, uh, adiabatic soliton compression, uh, taking the right fibers and so on, you might have a chance to get something, but uh, okay, that's a different story. But so for this never, there wasn't any CO detection. But um, if you take ethereum, um, you have a much easier life to generate short pulses and also to go to higher power levels so that you can get higher peak power levels. And already in 2011, the first gigahertz self-referenceable frequency com was built. So this was self-referenceable means you can see the CO beating signal, which is shown here. Uh, so this is the one gigahertz that you can see, and that's then the RF beating after the F to 2F interferometer. So you have one CO frequency on this side and then the beating to the other side uh, simply symmetrical with respect to the repetition rate. And um, that was a laser generating 290 femtosecond pulses at one gigahertz. The 290 femtosecond pulses were actually not good enough to generate a coherent octave spanning supercontinuum. Um, we had to temporarily compress it in a fiber to 100 femtoseconds, and then we could get the coherent supercontinuum. And uh, very recently, um, we also managed to do the first CO stabilization. So this 
laser. So a lot of these lasers, by the way, were built in the group of Ursula Keller, with whom we are still strongly collaborating. I spent a couple of years and did also my habilitation in Ursula Keller's group at ETH Zurich. And uh, so here you can see a picture of this gigahertz laser, which we then could CO stabilize. And uh, here we obtained uh, CO stability integrated phase noise that you can see here of 750 milliradian from measured from one hertz up to five megahertz, which is a pretty good result. And um, the pump laser is actually a multi-mode pump laser, which is something that was also not completely trivial because it introduces quite a lot of noise. And then you send it into the cavity the gain crystal is very close here to the output coupler, and uh, the cavity is formed from here to this point, which is a CSEM. Um, the gain is here and the pump is there, so we actually use an output coupler where we throw half of the power away, but there is still more than enough for launching it into the PCF and then building the F to 2F interferometer. So it is possible to do a one gigahertz laser without any amplification as a stabilized frequency comp. And we think that this should be also further scalable. Uh, Alexander, he, so Alexander Klenner, um, he recently finished his PhD, but he already managed to get operation at five gigahertz, but not CO detection or something like this yet. And I also think that it's possible to make similar designs like for the titanium sapphire laser and scale the whole thing to 10 gigahertz. Okay, so high average power. In the last lecture, I discussed a lot the thin disk lasers, which can generate very high power levels. And uh, so here you can see again the diagram. 275 watt of average power are possible, uh, but with slightly longer pulses or 80 microjoules. And, um, so this is a very promising technology for frequency comps with highest power levels. And uh, recently we also measured the first CO stabilization of a CSEM mode locked thin disk laser. And initially a lot of people were wondering if this is really possible because you have this multi-mode pump scheme. You use pump diets which have an M square value of 200 or 300. So really horrible pump quality in terms of transverse mode. And this introduces then mode beating, which is transferred to the laser, but it's still possible to do the CO stabilization. So in the first laser, what we used was an Iterbium Calgo laser. And this Calgo material is a material which has a much, much broader emission bandwidth than Iterbium YEC. And with this material, we generated up to 50 femtosecond pulses. In this case, we tuned the laser to approximately, I think, 80 femtoseconds where it operated quite stably. We also only had it running with up to two watts. And then we took a part of the power. We only needed 60 milliwatt of this laser to generate the coherent octave spanning supercontinuum, launched it into the F to 2F, and then sent the feedback to the laser diet. And we could stabilize it, and we also obtained uh, quite good integrated phase noise, which was only 120 milliradian. Now, that's not really the high power levels that we look for in a thin disk laser. So this was just the first proof of principle, showing that despite the fact that you have this multi-mode um, diet, you still can do the CO stabilization. Um, but recently, we also tried then the same at a much higher power level system. So we took uh, Ethereum YAC thin disk laser, we operated at 140 watts, and then we did a temporal pulse compression to about 100 femtoseconds uh, of a small part, because as here, we only need 60 milliwatt uh, with pulses of about uh, 100 femtoseconds at a repetition rate of, a, of a, I think here it was 60 megahertz. And um, that's a similar situation in this case. So we don't need a lot of power to get the octave spanning supercontinuum. And what we could see is that we have nice CO beats, more than 30 dB of signal to noise. 
Um, when we try to stabilize it, on the other hand, we saw that there are a few problems. The key problem for this laser is actually that on one side, it's hard to give a feedback to this diet. It's all in one, 1.2 kilowatt diet. And uh, it's not built for fast modulation. And it also has really a lot of noise in the, uh, in the regime in which this noise is a problem for the stabilization. The second problem is also that in this laser, actually, the relaxation oscillations are in a regime where they interfere with the CO stabilization. So they're in the few kilohertz regime, I think at 7 kilohertz or something like this. And that's also why you can see here a small bump. Uh, but uh, we think that it should be possible to stabilize it, for example, by then using the CSEM-based modulation approach which, with which you can be much faster. So for the pump diet so far, it was not possible to stabilize it. But uh, we think that with such thinnest lasers, it should be possible to really go to frequency comms of more than 100 watt. With fibers, what has been done so far is amplification systems. And I think there they are currently at the 80 watt level. So um, there are two groups working on it. On one side, then the group in Gila. And I think there was Ingmar Hartl, who led the development of such a fiber amplifier system with up to 80 watts. He's now a DAISY. And then you also have a group at MPQ. And um, there it's the group of Jens Limpert, who is developing the fibers from Jena. OK, spectral coverage. Um, so, so far, as I said, most lasers operate either with titanium sapphire, that's 800 nanometers, or you have fiber lasers. That's then either 1.5 micron or 1 micron for ethereum. Very recently, you also have a lot of work with tulium at 2 microns. But if you want to go to other regions, you're somewhat limited. And um, there are two directions that you can go to. One is to go to the ultraviolet. The other is to go to the mid-infrared. And the mid-infrared is particularly interesting for spectroscopy applications. So here you can see a picture from daylight solutions in which they just show absorpt strong absorption lines of molecules which are of interest either for security, medical applications, or in industrial production. And uh, so, for example, acetone or N2O, uh, CH4, and so on, they all have quite strong absorption lines in a regime between 3, 10, 11 microns, so in the mid-infrared spectral region. And that's why this spectral region is currently hot. A lot of people are doing work how to get into this regime, how to do spectroscopy there, dual com spectroscopy in this regime is extremely promising. And um, there are different ways how you can get there. One possibility is to use quantum cascade lasers. That's actually the, the product of daylight solutions. There you typically only have narrow lines. Uh, so that means that you might need to combine a few of these lasers if you want to do more complex spectroscopy. Um, another possibility recently was done in the group of Jerome Feist at ETH Zurich. He actually managed to get a frequency comb from a quantum cascade laser by four-wave mixing inside the laser, but that's a different system. So uh, nothing linked to ultrafast. And uh, the way to go to cover this region in a broad range right now is nonlinear optics. There's a very good paper from uh, Hench's group uh, published in, I think that was uh, Nature Photonics in 2012. And there he just gives an overview on various sources that you have for mid-infrared frequency comps. So, um, and the key things that you're currently using in order to generate is on one side you can do difference frequency generation. So you learned already all about this. And then in this way you have your signal, your pump, you send it in a chi 2 medium, and then afterwards you get uh, an idler with which you can do something. Or you can also build an OPO. Majid talked about this in detail. And uh, so you just need one pump radiation, and then you can generate idler and signal. Uh, you also have some very good systems 
uh, about the overall stabilization of such a system. So if you start with a femtosecond laser and then you want to stabilize the frequency comb, there are different schemes that you can use. You can, for example, then also do some sum frequency uh, between the signal and the pump and then beat it with a super continuum from the laser itself. In the group of Derek Reed at Harriet Watt University in St. Andrews, they investigated a lot um, frequency comms from OPO. So there are many things that you can do. Then another very promising method is also uh, care comm generation. So there you can generate frequency comms using a, a Chi-3 effect and in this way have also broad comms. So for example, uh, micro resonators done in the group of Tobias Kippenberg at APFL are one of the approaches that you can use. So you have then only a single frequency laser, send it in such a medium and afterwards get quite a lot of things out. And uh, here is a list of different materials, different results that have been achieved. So the power per mode as function of the frequency. And so for the micro resonator comps, you can get pretty high power levels because usually they are quite small and you have then gigahertz comps. The stabilization is then another question, but there also has been quite some progress. And then on the other side, he also shows, for example, the different materials. You already learned a lot about different materials. Many, many people are excited about OP, uh, optically um, orientation pattern gallium arsenide. So you already heard about this one. That's, I would say, at the moment, the best candidate if you really want to cover the mid-infrared spectral region. You have a very good nonlinear coefficient, and you can also do high power operation. So I think this is something where a lot of people would like to get their hands on. At the moment, the big problem is that this spectral region is not only interesting for, for spectroscopy and scientific applications, but also if you, for example, want to blind some um, detection devices for missiles and so on, it's a very interesting wavelength region. So high power laser in this region are used in the military. And um, that's why I think I am not even sure if it would be allowed to buy uh, OP uh, gas from the United States. I don't know. Marty, do you know anything about it? If, is it possible to get this stuff easily? Um, I think it's probably ITAR controlled, so you would need some permission to get it. OK. Mm, and BAE systems, I mean, no. Yeah, I mean, would be great. Uh, combining this material with a piplin, let's say a piplin based, op so uh, take a high power thin disk laser, then a piplin based OPO, and afterwards pumping OP gas, I think that would be fun. You could get to pretty high power levels with such a system. But okay, so, um, so this is just a small comment to. Uh, comms that you can do in this wavelength region. And finally, one big aspect for frequency comps is their compactness. So, okay, this is maybe a little bit mean because I'm showing one of the first generation titanium sapphire lasers. Uh, so here you have a Verdi pump, uh, which makes an 18 watts of green, needs more than a kilowatt of electrical power. You use this to pump then a titanium sapphire laser which is also a commercial system. Actually, I have to say this, this is an old picture. We now have a collaboration with, um, well, it was before laser optic. I think now it's laser quantum. And they make small titanium sapphire lasers. And I have to say, you can also get COM lasers all in one, where the green pump is integrated, maybe at this size um, of a table. But still, it is. It is nothing compared to a fiber laser or a small compact diet solid state, diet pump solid state laser. And the price probably is still well above 100K for such a system. And um, if you want to use these comms in real life, you need some other solution. You need something which is much cheaper than what you can get from, from such a device. 
And um, this is not only the case for COM applications, also if you want to use it in biomedical applications or other things, uh, you, you have a strong urge to develop lasers which are simpler and more compact. Now, one possibility that you can think of is uh, instead of using this green pump, going for the latest generation of diets, which also can generate green light. And um, today, you actually have companies, especially Nishia, developing green diets for laser projection applications. So um, you can get now diets which have one watt of output power. The mode quality is kind of okay. It's an M square of two by five. And um, this is something which ultimately will probably cost less than $50. So there is uh, Casio, for example, they are making a projector in which they have 18 one watt blue diets. And um, then I, uh, half of the power is, I think, sent to a phosphor, which makes a green. And then you also have red diets. And uh, in this way, you just make a lamp, which gives you the red, green, and blue wavelengths. You don't lose, use the properties of the laser light. It's just to have some light that you can use uh, for projection. And uh, in this way, instead of having a lifetime for a normal lamp, like in this projector of maybe 3,000 hours, you then have a lifetime of 30,000 hours and still a very high brightness. And if you now can also do the same, not using a phosphor, but using green diets, that, that will be a big breakthrough for the realization of projectors. And so we took such laser diets, um, two of them, one watt each, uh, green diets, and then pumped a titanium sapphire laser with it. The diets were air-cooled, and in the first realization, we obtained 200 milliwatts from a CSAM mode-locked titanium sapphire laser in 68 femtosecond pulses. And very recently, Kutan Gurel, who is a PhD student doing this project, he also tried care lens mode locking, and he also optimized the system a little bit. Uh, he also overdrove the diets because we don't need a lifetime of 30,000 hours or so. If we have uh, 100 hours and we get a nice result, we are also happy. So he increased the pump current and made then 1.5 watt per diet and obtained in the end, I think it was uh, 350 milliwatts in uh, 40 femtosecond pulses or 450 milliwatts in 50 femtosecond pulses. And the repetition rate is around 500 megahertz. So it's a quite compact cavity, as you can see here. And in principle, such a system, I could imagine that you very easily can integrate it in a really, really compact package. So this is one possibility to go. Um, but if you want to go even further, you would like to have something even cheaper. And there, uh, at ETH Zurich and Ursula Keller's group, they are developing semiconductor-based ultra-fast lasers based on vertical emitters. Uh, we have a large project together with them. We're also in collaboration with the Metrology Institute of Switzerland or ABB or a microscopy center. And there the target is really to develop such semiconductor lasers and show that it's useful for biomedical and also metrology applications. And very recently in Ursula Keller's group, they then realized the first gigahertz self-referenceable frequency com from such a semiconductor laser. So the semiconductor laser used there is a vertical emitting cavity surface emitting laser, a vexel. Basically, you can imagine this like a thin disk laser, only that instead of having a 100 micron thick gain crystal, you replace it by a semiconductor. And in the semiconductor, it looks like a CSEM, only that you pump it externally so that you have a um, gain inside the semiconductor element. And you keep the advantages that you can do power scaling by going to larger areas. So here you have the CSEM, here you have the Vexel, here you have a curved output coupler and you have a pump from the side. Looks pretty much like the thinnest laser. One advantage is around the quantum well, or in this case it's seven quantum wells, you can put some spacer layers which then absorb the pump light, so you pump above the, the bandage, and then in this way you only need a single pass 
into the material to absorb the full pump. And this laser generated then, I think it was 300 femtosecond pulses, a few hundred milliwatts, and uh, at, a, at the gigahertz level, and then it was sent into a, a fiber to amplify it, because at the gigahertz level you still have a problem um, with pulse energy. And afterwards here, you also add SPM, so that you then can compress it. And uh, afterwards you still do an additional fiber compression. And finally you have your F to 2F interferometer. So at the moment this is a rather complex system, but later you can also imagine to make it much more complex by, for example, trying to replace this amplifier by some waveguide-based amplifier. And then also hopefully at one point this PCF by some other waveguide-based much shorter device with which you can generate the supercontinuum. And so they obtained an octave-spanning supercontinuum which was coherent and also could see the CO beads and then the next step will be the stabilization of such a system. So at the moment in the first step, the laser itself is very compact, gigahertz uh, small. The additional things around it are quite large, but we hope that in the future you can also reduce this quite a lot in size. And so, yeah, th that's the first summary about the frontiers and frequency comes from diet pump solid state lasers. So you can reach very low noise operation. There are different methods how you can do the stabilization. Also for thin disk lasers, it's possible to do the frequency comms. Um, you can extend the spectral coverage on one side by going to the mid-infrared using OPOs or difference frequency, for example. And hopefully in the not too far future, you will also be able to build very compact devices. Um, so now we still have 15 minutes left. And in the last time, I actually didn't fully finish all of my slides. Um, I have to say that there are probably, I don't know, 40 slides or something like this. <laughs> I think it will be a little bit hard uh, to go through all of them. So what I will do is just I will make a best of collection of some of the results <laughs> and uh, still keep us five minutes for discussion. So let's quickly go through. Okay, so pulse compression. <laughs> let's forget the past, how pulse compression was done in 2003. Let's just have a look at today. So we saw that with the high power thin disk lasers, you can get power levels in the 100 watt regime, pulse energies of tens of microjoules, hopefully soon hundreds of microjoules. But if you take ethereum yak, which is the greatest and best thin disk material that is commercially available, there are other ones which are better, but not really in high quality commercially available, you are limited in pulse duration to a few hundred femtoseconds. If you want to do high field science or other applications where you need shorter pulses, you need to figure a way out how to do this. And one possibility is to temporarily compress these pulses by using self-phase modulation and just broadening the spectrum. And um, so what you do, maybe I go still one back because here you can see if you just take a laser that was in 2002, send it into a microstructured fiber, then in this fiber, so this is picosecond pulse, in the time domain, not so much happens. In the frequency domain, initially the phase was flat, and then you get a curved phase, and the phase is right that during the propagation in this material which has positive dispersion, you simply create bandwidth. Because it's a short fiber of 17 centimeters that was used here for microjoule pulses, in the positive dispersion regime, uh, what you generate then actually uh, is mainly dominated by SPM, you don't have a lot of dispersion. The dispersion is for such large mode area fibers, basically the one of fused silica. And that's why you have this strong modulation. But nevertheless, you still com can compress it. In this case, for microjoule pulses, uh, it was possible in 2003 to compress it to the level uh, of 33 femtoseconds. And um, so that's something which works great. But the problem that you had here was we were using a fiber which had a solid core in the middle. And if you're above a peak power level of four megawatt, 
up to six megawatt, depending on polarization, you actually get into big trouble with self-focusing due to uh, the care effect inside the fiber. So this is nice for compressing microjoule level pulses to even sub 10 femtoseconds if you optimize everything, but it's not energy scalable. And today, what you actually can do is that you can use other fibers which actually do not have a solid core. So here you can see a picture of a hollow core photonic crystal fiber. It has a Kagome structure that's a Japanese uh, basket making technique. And uh, so that's this structure here. And in the middle, you simply have a hole. And the overlap that the mode inside here has with the surrounding glass is extremely low. And that means that you can propagate pulses with very high peak power levels without any damage. Now, you can also have SPM simply by putting a gas inside the fiber and in this way do then pulse broadening. And uh, so in this system here, we took such a fiber and uh, so we had a laser which generated 50 microjoule pulses at 150 watt of power. And then we launched it in such a fiber, hollow core photonic crystal fiber, filled with five bar of argon. And uh, the mode field diameter was 30 micrometers. And afterwards, we simply compressed the pulses. So here we generate the bandwidth. Here we simply have a kind of soliton pulse. And then uh, afterwards, with the grating, we compress the pulses. We again have some modulation, which is basically due to SPM, so strongly modulated. But in this case, it was possible to compress it to the 100 femtosecond regime. And, uh, or in, this in the first case, it was two, sub 200 femtosecond, but the new results are even better, I think, sub 100 femtosecond. So we had 100 watt output power compressed to sub 200 femtoseconds, and the compression had 80% of efficiency. And this can be pushed much further by optimizing the whole system. So these are now pulse energies which are significantly higher than what you can do by using glass-based fibers. And um, then another system which is interesting, so these high peak powers that you can get from mode lock lasers allow you for efficient frequency conversion. And here I don't want to go into the detail so we built a long time ago, that was still at the end of my PhD, we built a system which starting at one micron, then in the end generated red, green, and blue at the same time. And so you do first second harmonic generation, so then you have the green, then you build a two-stage OPO, you needed two different stages because in, if you want to have high conversion efficiency for parametric generation, well, parametric generation means that you need a gain of, let's say, at least 80 dB or something like this. You have a Gaussian pulse, and then basically only in the middle you amplify it, and uh, that leads to a gain narrowing. And when you come into the region where you want to do the efficient um, amplification, then you mess up the M square of the generated beam. But okay, this is... And if you have two stages, one for the signal generation, and then afterwards, have an efficient one, uh, OPG with only less than 10 dB, you can generate a high quality beam. And then you had 1.5 and 800, and you could do some frequency with the 1030 light to the blue and the red, and uh, then have multi-watt output powers in the end. Ah, here, that's actually a slide where you can see what is happening. So the pump, you send it in, the signal, initially is not really there, but then increases at the end. So at the end, you have kind of a power amplifier section. This is a pre-amplifier section. And uh, the gain guiding simply makes that the signal radius will be much smaller than the pump radius. And the pump will be destroyed by this. And you get a bad M squared. So if you make a diagram of conversion efficiency, uh, oops, so that, that was an article uh, by Gunther Arisom, who does really great simulations of nonlinear optics. And uh, so basically you get a kind of offset between conversion efficiency and M square. If you want to go to very high conversion efficiency in a single OPG stage at high power levels, 
uh, with large beam diameters where um, uh, the opening up of the normal beam doesn't give you so much importance, you mess up the M squared beam. So there's a trade-off between conversion efficiency and beam quality. If you do it with two stages, life is much easier. And in the end, we could have a nice system uh, where we had wonderful colors in the lab, uh, which gave then more than 10 watt in each color already in 2004. And uh, that would have been a wonderful system for making a laser display, but actually it never happened. And that's also something which unfortunately happens often. Uh, you develop a nice system, but it's too expensive. The market is not there. Uh, initially, actually, we received even uh, some money from Kodak, but Kodak is also not, was also not doing too well at one point. <laughs> But actually, uh, other people did it, and at Sony, they built a projector which actually had a, um, which actually had a really huge screen size. So um, here you can see a picture of the screen. It's, uh, it was built for the World Exhibition in Aichi in 2005, and the screen size was 2,500 inch. So these are people standing here. What they did is they transformed an ice skating hall in the expo uh, area in a cinema which could seat 900 people. And uh, this projector, so 50 meters was the image long, 10 meters wide, was then uh, based on three different projectors. In order to get this image uh, recorded, they actually had to make a special camera. So they took three cameras style George Lucas, uh, Star Wars, took the image, split it up into three different of these cameras, and then afterwards had three projectors projecting it. The type of projector they used was based on a MEMS device, which was, I think, uh, developed in Bloom's group in Stanford. And uh, he started a company, Silicon Light Machine, focusing on the use of this, I think, initially for telecom. Sony bought the rights to use it for projectors. It's basically a ribbon um, where you just use electrostatic uh, attraction for being able to fast switch these ribbons from a grating position to a standard position. And in this way, you can have kilohertz modulation speeds, but only for a line. But that's good enough to modulate a single line if you have a laser. And that's why it also only works with a laser. You simply then afterwards can create your beam by scanning one line over the image. And at that time, Texas Instruments had a really, really hard time uh, Texas to increase the number of micromirrors on their chip. Texas Instruments had the competitive pro um, product to this, where they simply have the single mirrors, which can switch their position. Also, MEMS devices, maybe in this projector, there's one in. Initially, it was scale, scaling this to 1,000 by 2,000 pixels was quite hard for them. And with this, you simply can just make one modulator which has 1,000 pixels and then simply scan it around and easily get the 1,000 by 2,000 HDTV. Um, you just need a scanning mirror and a device which is fast enough. The image quality that you could obtain was great. As I said, you need a laser beam because these... Ribbons are only uh, yeah, 25 microns. I think you have it to make it much smaller, actually. But, um, so, but you can even use diet lasers, because in one dimension, they have a very good beam quality. In the other one, it is bad. But if you then flatten it out, it works. So this is a project which worked very well. And uh, the image quality that you could get from this was great. Um, it was done because already 30 years ago or 20 years ago, they had a world exhibition and there Sony did a big screen by using Triniton televisions, was also the first of its kind. And so this is, to my knowledge, still the largest laser projector in the world. Because you use laser light, uh, you also can have a really good color gamut. So because you can select the wavelengths, 532 here, and then the different other points for the red and the blue. 
The red and the blue were generated by diet lasers, which were developed by Sony themselves. The green was done by using a microchip laser, which was an amplified in a fiber amplifier, and frequency doubled to the green. And all of this was manufactured at Sony. The total laser power was quite incredible. I don't remember the details, but I think for projector maybe something like 40 watt per color or something like this. So uh, it, it was a quite impressive laser system. And also Sony developed laser back projectors, which had a wonderful quality, but unfortunately they were too expensive. At that time, the whole lasers, one expected that the laser price would drop down. The price of other techniques like uh, flat panel displays based on LCDs would stay relatively high, but unfortunately it was the other way around. The lasers stayed expensive, and so in the end, uh, I think Sony now sold the business and uh, probably silicon light machines might even have acquired back the rights. I'm not 100% sure what is happening there. But so far, there is, to my knowledge, no real effort for laser projectors. It might change with new lasers, which become cheaper and cheaper. Uh, but maybe one comment. Uh, you actually can buy laser projectors, but the area for which they are now used somehow changed. So here you can see a projector which you can buy. Um, it's a laser projector, but it just uses, whoop, so, uh, so here you hardly can see it because there's too much uh, light around us. I think it's only 30 lumens or something like this. But because it's, so here you have a MEMS device which makes a fast scanning, so one single mirror which then simply scans the image around. And the nice thing is that no matter what distance I am, you always have a good image because it's simply a laser projector. You don't do any, any imaging. And so you can connect this directly to your iPhone and if you're in a dark room, you can show the pictures to other people uh, in a pretty good quality. And I think this is something which probably might happen in the not too far future, that in your cell phones you will have integrated projectors, which at one point will not cost a lot. So, and maybe one comment, the laser for the green, so the blue and the red, that's easy. These are semiconductor lasers, but in the first generation, I hope also in this one, because at one point I want to open it and have a look what is in there. <laughs> um, Osram developed a semiconductor laser, which is a frequency doubled um, uh, vexel, so the laser that I talked about before for the mode locking, so a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. Then you put probably a piplin chip inside there, and they made it less than 0.4 cube centimeters and obtained more than 70 milliwatt of green. So it's an extremely small laser. And in principle, I would say that the technology for a mode locked vexel is not more complicated than for a frequency doubled vexel. So one could hope that if somebody puts enough money into the development, that we might have soon femtosecond laser of this size with a price which is kind of ridiculous because this projector costs only $360. Uh, you can imagine how much the laser source inside there costs. So I think the future is very bright for the development of lasers uh, which are compact, reliable, and, uh, and cheap. And uh, with this, I just skip all the other stuff with harmonics and so on. And I just wanted to show the last slide. If I find the button for the home, that might be this one. Yeah, perfect. And so um, a summary with the high power lasers, you have a technology which can provide you very high power levels from a relatively simple system. Uh, I expect that you can further scale them up to hundreds of microjoules, kilowatt power levels. Um, they have very good applications for nonlinear optics. I didn't have time to talk about a lot of them, but I think for, you can compress them to the few cycle regime at hundreds of watts of average power. 
You can use them then for high harmonic generation, intralaser, high harmonic generation. That's a project for which I received an ERC starting grant. And there we hope that we can have a very simple system for generating frequency comps in the XUV uh, via high harmonic generation, UV generation, mid-infrared generation, terahertz generation, and so on. And um, I also would like to thank the whole team in Neuchâtel and uh, also the team of Ursula Keller at ETH Zurich with whom we have a strong collaboration for the development of lasers. So thank you very much for your attention.